Okay, this is AP, AB, and BC Calculus. We're doing Unit 6, Section 7, which is the Fundamental Theorem of Calculus and Definite Integrals. So we're going to go ahead and jump right into this. So we've already addressed the first Fundamental Theorem of Calculus and how it's applied when we can find the area under a curve using geometric shapes. Uh, now we're going to learn how to use antiderivative rules to evaluate all definite integrals. We're going to learn the bulk of those antiderivative rules, uh, which you will need to make note cards for, in 6.8, which is the next video. Uh, for this section, I'm going to cheat and introduce you to one rule so that we can use it to practice using the first fundamental theorem of calculus. So the first antiderivative rule that you're going to learn is that uh, is the power rule, right? So you learned the power rule for derivatives, right? Uh, power rule for derivatives is you drop the coefficient, uh, you drop the power down as a coefficient, and then you lower the coefficient or the exponent rather by, by one. So here we're going to do exactly the opposite. We're going to start by raising the exponent by 1. So if the exponent was originally an n, it's now an n plus 1, and dividing by that new power. So just as a reminder, right, if I just cheat, uh, sorry, if I just cheat over here for just a sec. So just a reminder that when you differentiate x to the n, what you do is drop the power down in front and then lower the power by 1, right? So the first thing we did was uh, drop the power down as a coefficient, which is essentially multiplication, just to be clear, right? That's multiplication. And the second thing we did was lower the power by one, right? So, um, so if you logic your way through the opposite of doing this, right? So it's called an antiderivative for a reason. It's the opposite of the derivative, right? If we were to logic our way through doing this in the ver reverse, the first thing we'd have to undo is we would undo this by raising the power by one, right? So the opposite of lowering the power by one, we raise it by one. And then instead of multiplying, we would divide by the new power. And then you can see that that's exactly what happens here if we use this antiderivative, right? We raise the exponent by 1, so now it's n plus 1, and then we divide by that new, new power, the entire quantity, n plus 1. So as an example, the antiderivative, right, so, so if f of x, or let's just say x to the 6th, then its antiderivative would be x to the 7th over 7. Right? Raise the power by 1, divide by the new power. So notice here that lowercase f is my original function and uppercase f is my antiderivative, which of course, since I'm terrible at capitalizing things, as you can see from my handwriting, is a nightmare for me. All right, so let's go ahead and walk through the first fundamental theorem of calculus. So the two ways we've seen this written, where, where capital F is the antiderivative of lowercase f, is that if we integrate from a to b of lowercase f, we get its antiderivative, capital F of b, minus capital F of a. The other way you'll see that is integrating an f prime, and then we can just use the nice lowercase f of b minus lowercase f of a, which is much nicer for those of us who clearly failed kindergarten and can't capitalize correctly. So let's go ahead and walk through how this is going to work. So we're going to evaluate the integral. So when we integrate, right, so when we integrate, what's going to happen is we're going to raise the power by 1 and divide by the new power. Notice I'm putting these in these brackets, right, and then we're going to put at the back of the brackets, the same two things that I'm going to evaluate, I'm going to evaluate from 0 to 2. So what that's going to mean is top bound, so 2 to the 4th over 4, minus my antiderivative at the bottom bound. So I'm going to end up getting that this is 16 fourths minus 0, which is just 4. And that's it. So uh, again, this is the antiderivative. That's not how you spell antiderivative. Right, so that's my antiderivative, and this is my bottom bound and my top bound, and so this is that antiderivative evaluated at the top bound minus the antiderivative evaluated at the lower bound. All right, let's go ahead and try a P1. Feel free to pause me. So my antiderivative is going to be raise the power by 1, divide by the new power, right? And I'm going to evaluate that from 1 to 3. I do have to write that. I can't just write the antiderivative. I have to write that it is equivalent because there were bounds here, so there are also bounds here. Here, right? That's important. So then I do top bound minus what happens when I plug in the bottom bound. So I'm going to get 27 thirds minus 1 third, which gives me a 26 thirds. All right. All right, let's try one that's slightly harder, right? So now we have a, a sum or difference, right? So we've seen with integral rules before that I'm allowed to essentially treat each one of these pieces as its own integral, right? It's the sum or difference. So I'm going to integrate the 3x squared by raising the power by 1 and dividing by the new power, which will be convenient. 
And then this, remember that this is actually a minus 4x to the 0. So when I raise the power by 1, it's going to become an x to the first over 1. And I'm going to evaluate that from negative 1 to 2. So if we clean this up to look a little bit nicer, this is going to be an x cubed minus a 4x. And I'm going to be evaluating from negative 1 to 2. So my top bound is going to be 2 cubed minus 4 times 2. That's when I plug in the top value minus, in parentheses, the entire quantity when I plug in negative 1 cubed minus 4 times a negative 1. So notice this is the whole top bound being plugged in, and this is the whole bottom bound being plugged in. If I clean these up, I get an 8 minus 8 in the first set of parentheses, minus, this will be a negative 1 plus 4, so I'm going to get 0 minus a 3, which seems to come out to be a negative 3. All right. Same thing here, give it a try without me if you want. So uh, remember this is originally an x to the first, so when I up the power by 1 and divide by the new power, I'm going to get a 10x squared over 2 minus, this is a 4x to the fourth all over 4. So I'm going to clean those up in just a second, and I'm evaluating from negative 2 to 1. So it seems to me that I have a 5x squared minus an x to the fourth, and I'm evaluating from negative 2 to 1. So I'm going to get that this is in my top bound. It's going to be a 5 times a 1 minus a 1 minus, and then my bottom bound is going to be a 5 times a 4 minus, the negative 2 to the 4th would be a positive 16. All right, so I get that this is a 5 minus 1, which is 4, minus, this is a 20 minus 16, which is also 4. So after all that work, I get a 0. All right, moving on. So this one's a little bit trickier because in order to apply the power rule, and we've seen this before when we were differentiating, I'm going to need to recognize that a square root is the same as an x to the 1 half. So I'm going to up the power by 1, which would be 1 half plus 1 is 3 halves, and divide by that new power. And we'll talk about what that's going to look like in just a second. So that's a 1 to 16. Well, when you divide by 3 halves, it's the same as multiplying by 2 thirds. And it's going to be a lot easier to look at it like this. So I'm going to get that this is a 2 thirds times this 16 to the 3 halves, which we'll deal with in a sec, minus a 2 thirds times a 1 to the 3 halves. I'm guessing most of us feel comfortable with the 1 to the 3 halves, but let's just do a little bit of side work to show what happens with the 16 to the 3 halves. So a 16 to the 3 halves. You can do one of two ways. You can either treat it as a 16 cubed inside a square root, but ugh, that's not mental math, right? That's not mental math, right? Or you could do the slightly more clever option of recognizing that you could do the square root of 16 quantity cubed, which is mental math, because we can do 4 cubed to get 64. So I'm going to get that this is a 2 thirds times a 64 minus a 2 thirds times a 1. If I were you, I'd factor out the 2 thirds and just get a 63 here. So I end up with a 126 over 3. You also could have made it 128 over 3 minus 2 over 3 and you still get the 126. All right, same idea. Before I can start with this one, I'm going to have to rewrite that 1 over x squared as an x to the negative second, right? So when I up the power by 1, well, 1 more than a negative 2 is a negative 1, and I divide by that new power. So I'm evaluating from 1 to 2. I'm going to get, if I clean this up a little bit, it doesn't really matter which floor I put the negative on, and I'm going to find that it's much easier to put the x on the bottom floor, right? It doesn't matter if I put the negative down with the x or on top with the 1. A negative and a fraction can go on either floor. So I'm going to get that this is negative 1 half minus a negative 1 over 1. That's a negative 1 half plus a 1, so after all that work, I get a 1 half. All right, so the last thing we're going to touch base on is how you might use a calculator to do some of this. So you can't use a calculator to integrate indefinite integrals. That, that means integrals that don't have boundaries, okay? So this, indefinite integrals, mean in integrals with no bounds, so no bounds. These integrals that we're using right now do have bounds, right? So since we have these boundaries, this negative 1 and this 2, I can use my calculator to integrate. It's not actually integrating. It's actually doing a very high-level estimate, similar to what you learned with sums earlier in this unit, uh, but with very, very small interval widths. So if I wanted to integrate 5x squared plus 3x minus 8, this whole function, uh, from negative 1 to 2, what I'd do is I'd put the entire function in as my 1, and then I'd use math 9, which is function integrate. Now, if you're using the classic version of your calculator, 
you're going to put the function you want to integrate, which is in this case y1, because you'll see I put it in as y1. You're going to put an x, and then you're going to put the lower bound, and then the upper bound. And you get a negative 4.5. If you're using the fancy math print version of your calculator, it's actually going to look like an integral. So then you're basically just plugging the exact things in that you see, uh, including plugging in the x after the d. Either of those are completely fine. Uh, I, I grew up using, because, uh, you know, I'm really, really old, I grew up using the classic mode, and I still like using classic mode. Um, but the larger reason I promote you getting comfortable with classic mode is if your calculator dies in the middle of an AP test and you have to use a loaner, not every calculator has math print. So what if you end up with a calculator that only has this option? It's sort of like a car that you can drive automatic or you can drive a stick shift, right? If you're used to driving an automatic car and you've never driven a stick shift and somehow you find yourself in a situation where you need to be able to drive a stick shift car, you're not going to be able to pick it up just by trying it. It's much more difficult. Um, it's not intuitive, whereas uh, driving an automatic car is fairly intuitive for most people. Same idea here. This is really intuitive. It looks exactly like what you would expect to see on a piece of paper, just like this. So if you had never used math print before, but you picked up a calculator that was in math print mode, you'd still be all right because it's intuitive. But if you picked up a calculator that didn't have this mode and you'd never used this before, you'd feel completely lost. Um, you also, just for the record, would not have to put y1 in here. You could have actually typed the function 5x squared plus 3x minus 8 because it's not a really ugly function. As you'll see in some other problems later on in this class, um, sometimes there are going to be really ugly functions that you're not going to want to have to type the whole thing out. So you type it one time in y1 and then you can use it as much as you need to. So anyway, that's how you do it. We're going to do two more problems using a calculator now. So this is a fairly ugly function. You don't know enough to integrate this by hand, which is intentional. So this is pretty common AP problem. It's sort of classic first fundamental theorem of calculus. You're given f prime, you're told what f of 3 is, and you're asked what f of 10 is. Well, we know from the first fundamental theorem of calculus that if I integrate from 3 to 10 of f prime of x dx, I should get f of 10, which is the quantity that I've been asked to find, right, minus f of 3, which I've been told is a 7, right? I know this. So I can use my calculator to do this. I can use my calculator. What I'm going to do is I'm going to put in as y1 this function that was given to me, right? So I'm going to go into my y1, and I'm going to put x squared cosine of 0.1x, right? And then I double check that it's right. I make sure that I'm in radian mode, although I already know I am, and I go ahead and quit out. Now I want math 9. Right? And I'm going to go to vers over to y vers function, and I'm going to pick y1, comma, with respect to x from, and the reason I picked 3 and 10 were because those are the values of, of f that I know. I know f of 3, and I want f of 10. So from 3, comma, to 10, all right, and I'm going to hit enter. So I'm going to store that as alpha a, so sto alpha a, just so I have it, okay? So I get that this is approximately a 230.375 dot, 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 okay, and that would be f of 10 minus f of 3, which is a 7, so I'm just going to add the 7 over. So I'm going to get that f of 10 is approximately 237.375, and I go to three places, and that's it. So this is a pretty common AP problem, either as a multiple choice or as one prompt in a much larger free response where you're required to use a calculator to demonstrate your knowledge of the first fundamental theorem of calculus. So go ahead and give this one a try. Um, here I have f of 1, and I'm asked for f of 5, right? So if I integrate from 1 to 5 of f prime of x dx, I'm going to get f of 5, which is the thing that I want to find, minus f of 1, which is the thing I know. Oh, as a side note, notice I didn't use any calculator notation here. I just used my calculator, but I have to communicate this information. Like, this, this piece of information has to be communicated. I, I can't ignore that in favor of calculator notation. So same thing here. You need to communicate this step, right? You, you need to communicate this. You can use your calculator to actually integrate. So in order to do that, I'm going to go back uh, to my y equals, and I'm going to go ahead and type in x plus second natural log is my e, uh, e to the x. Close that parenthesis for the exponent close the one that's in front of the sine, sine of 2x, close the parentheses. And I already know that I'm in radian mode, so I quit out of that. I'm kind of lazy, so I'm going to hit second enter, second enter, rather than type the whole thing again. And now I'm just going to change my bounds, uh, because I already know I want y1 with respect to x. Uh, I want negative 2 to 5. And that's, oh, sorry, it's not negative 2, it's 1. Whew, that would have been embarrassing, right? All right, there we go. 1 to 5, make sure it's your x coordinate. There we go. 
all right? And I get this answer, so I get that this is approximately 34.243, and that's approximately equal to f of 5 uh, minus a negative 2, right? So uh, this is the same as f of 5 plus 2, right? It's minus a negative 2. So I'm going to subtract the 2 over, and I should get 32.243 is approximately my f. So again, this is a pretty common AP question. Um, really, you just need to show this, this information right here, right? Um, it wouldn't hurt to, to show the step where you show that you found this integral, right? Um, but, but basically, if you communicate that these things are equal, that's most of what the AP needs. Um, and that is our section seven.